Thank you, Rika. She took my class last fall, and she's exceptional all the way around, right? And so I grew up in the woods in northern Michigan. My father's a forester, and uh, we were set free to run through the woods all the time and explore around. And as I got older and was going to college at Michigan State, I, they sent me a little list of things to to major in. I looked through them all, you know, chemistry, physics, and all this sort of stuff. And then I, I knew a lot of stuff. And I looked at geology. I'd never heard anything about it, but I realized where I was raised, there was rocks and all this stuff and big sandstone cliffs and everything that. There was a rock, and I thought, maybe I should learn about this thing we're on. Maybe we have to take care of it somehow. And so I started on a long pilgrimage to, uh, to figure out what we're doing here. And I know we all try to figure out what we're doing here, and we'll never really understand that, fortunately, but it's kind of interesting to know what the Earth is. So you'll, you'll understand this is going on. I'm going I'm to tell you about a few simple things today, and I'm going to give you some homework at the end. I think you'll enjoy the homework, too, at the end. So as I got on into, into geology, I started looking around the Earth, and uh, one of the things is you, uh, these are the volcanoes of the world, and I thought, and they're People say, oh, they're everywhere, and they just crop up here and there. And Aristotle worried about Stromboli over in the Mediterranean. He said there was a fire down in the earth. And when you're an undergraduate, they're telling you various things. There are pots of magma down there, huge things coming up. And but as time went on, you, you look at it, and you say, well, they're not just everywhere. They're, they're places where they're really rather systematic for around the Pacific, you know, the Mediterranean, there are areas here and there, and there's Hawaii in the middle and stuff like this. And the question came up, why are they there? And what, what's going on? I was... I was also impressed deeply by the fact that evidently the Earth is alive. This stuff is coming out, and it comes out at about 1,200 degrees centigrade, and it's telling us that deep in the Earth, without going too far, there are, there are things happening. And, uh, and then the whole science of plate tectonics, and we've discovered that the continents were drifting around. This happened when I was an undergraduate and things. And the thing that really impressed me on this is that the outline of the continents and when I was in first grade, I said to Mrs. Lehman, my first grade teacher, it looks like you could connect up South America and Africa and put these back together. And she said, that's foolish. She screws your hand. She took a ruler and whacked me on the hand a few times. <laughs> Don't think things like that. You know, things like that. So I thought, okay. So, and uh, so as time went on, I realized that's exactly what was going on. That uh, <laughs> after we knew, we could piece these all back together in the, the, with the o oceanic ridges and things. And then suddenly, as this happened, people realized that there was a whole process going on. The Earth is an engine. There was, there's things, the Earth's core is hooked up, the magnetic field comes out of the core, there's heat being generated, the mantle down below here is stirring, and this stuff comes up and moves over. And, and of course, since everything's moving, the, uh, the Earth can't be just getting larger and larger as a hollow sphere, so stuff has to go back down inside the Earth. And we call these plates, these tectonic plates, they actually thicken as they cool thermally, as they get away from them, they go back down, and they go down often around continents. Continents are light material, and the continents are actually made from melting of stuff down here in the Earth, and it's a distillation machine. It's melting takes place over here, partial melting, a little bit of material comes up here, and it goes down here and gets melted again, it comes up. So it's like a refinery. So you get primitive material that came originally with the Earth a long, you know, four and a half billion years ago, and then you get more melting, and eventually you get continental material, and this is the stuff that floats around and doesn't, never goes back down because it's low density. It's like a, like a boat or a raft. And then we show these pictures here, and you can see this picture out of a textbook, and they got magma just, where is it coming from? How does that actually work? And these, all this sort of stuff. I got really interested in, in the details of this. And you look at around, and you, you heard of the, the Pacific Ring of Fire. And then as I got to graduate school in Berkeley, out there, we not only had the Pacific Ring of Fire, but we had the San Andreas Fault, and we had things going on. And Berkeley was a place, when you ask a question, they didn't say to you, what, what, that's foolish. And then they said, oh. No, tell me about that. What's your ideas about that? And back and forth. I really felt deeply intellectually appreciated when I asked questions. People listened, and they said, well, maybe you can go and study that and figure it out, what the, what's going on there. And there were, there were people doing things on, 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 around various parts of the world trying to figure things out. It was a revolutionary time. And one of the things that was really a mystery is when you look to these areas, they call them island arcs. And like South America, and here at the Aleutian Islands, Kamchatka, even our own Cascades, and they always were fighting over where the magma comes from. Does it come from melting of the bottom of the continent? Is it a plate going down? What is going on? When I started looking at the Aleutians, I realized here's a volcanic arc that stretches out from a continent. You can see the continental shelf here. It goes across the continent, out into an oceanic regime. So I thought, here, we can go out here and we look at the magma. Does it vary? If it doesn't vary, that means it's coming from somewhere deeper in there. So I thought to myself, terrific. I'm going to go up there. Well, it's... It's a pretty inhosp inhospitable part of the world to go. There's six days of sunshine per year up there. And uh, 
70, 80, 90 mile an hour winds, they're not called hurricanes, they're just called storms. And the Aleuts who live up there call them bulliwas, they're just a big wind, you know, so. And, and it, you know, and it rains a lot. And, and out to this part, there's, there's a, a large Kodiak bears and, uh, and, and, and packs of wolves and all kinds of things. And being raised in the woods, I thought, oh, that just adds a little excitement to it, you know, so. So I went up there and I thought, first of all, after I got up on the volcanoes in, in, in the middle of June, end of June, I thought, where are the rocks? They're under the snow, that's where they are. So we're way up there, and I thought I could add the mountaineering into it. I love uh, learning mountaineering. I love that and everything. So I get into it, and we get up there, and all of a sudden, you know, our tents gets blown down, and uh, we get a few samples, and we say, well, let's retreat. We go down to lower elevations. This is what we find. These guys, they're interested in, what are you guys doing here? You're helping us or what? <laughs> so we avoid them, and I go back home, and I look at, I look at now, and I say to myself, well, what's going on here? And the first thing I realized, if I plotted up all the volumes of magma coming out, is that... You go out the Aleutians, and the plate is moving like this, and as soon as the plate motion goes alongside of the Aleutians, the volcanism goes to zero. There are other little islands here, but there's no volcanism on until it gets to Kamchatka, and it starts up again. I thought, oh, that's very interesting. No plate going down, no volcanism. You have to have stuff going down. So the other thing I did is when I was going out the Aleutians, fly out, or you have a, this is one of the few clear days, you look at it, the volcanoes seem odd. They seem like they're lined up with each other. So I start looking at, there's a guy up at, Dar at Dartmouth one time, Professor Sto Stoibler, who is, who's dead now, but he said that you know, he could see alignments in volcanoes and the cascades and things. So this is the eastern Aleutians, and this is the western Aleutians. I just put them so you can put them on the same sheet here. And if you actually just take the active cones, the top of the cones of the active ones, you can actually line them all up. There's some breaks and things in here, but there's, for hundreds of kilometers, they're absolutely on these, these lines. Some of them only have two points, but many of them have. And then there are breaks, and we'll tell you about these breaks in a minute. These are breaks, and we have names on them and things like that, and we'll see. So if you go out in the Central Aleutians, for example, on an island that I actually worked on way out, you go on an island like this, and here's a break happens right in one island. And if you look to the, to the east, over towards Great Sitkin, because the alley, it's called the Kanatana, the great emptier of the bowels, they said it was called. They have another word. But, uh, and uh, so this is over here. Whoop. They have a, the f the look down this way, and you look behind me, you'll see in a second that there's a, a difference right here, a break right in the island. And I've wondered what these were. Well, if you look in the Pacific Plate, there are things called fracture zones. You see these different colors. These are different ages. The plate has little breaks along the ridge where it goes back and forth. And there's different, slightly different cooling ages. And it, when the plate was much older, the mo mo motion was this way. So there are these breaks up here by the Aleutians. And I'll be darned if it goes along like this. And one of the segment, one of those breaks called the ADAC fracture zone comes right through here. That's not in the plate we're standing on. We're standing on the North American plate. This break is in the Pacific plate, which is 150 kilometers below this point right here. But it's affecting the volcanoes. If you turn around and look to the west towards Kamchatka, you look out there and you see this. They're perfectly lined up. In fact, you can't even see the other volcano 100 kilometers away because it's right behind the point of this. And I'm on, right on the summit of this one. Exactly lined up. And if you look around the world, all the island arcs of the world, we pointed this out, all the arcs of the world have it. Here's, here's Indonesia, and you can go on. So that's one thing. These things are in touch with the plate going down underneath. And when the plate going down has a slightly different attitude, though all the volcanoes are affected by it. So we went back and looked at more things. And when you're stuck in tents up there, and you get your average, your, your one day in the field season when you can see things, you start noticing other things. And that is that the weather's just as bad. We have to live in caves sometimes. It rips our tent apart. That, and we have to stay inside of here for weeks at a time. We look like desperados, something like you'd see in northern Afghanistan now or something. And uh, <laughs> good food, though. We have good food. That's, you know, and, uh, and we have guys looking after us. These guys with packs of 20, 18, 20 wolves come down, just the nicest, calmest things in the world, never harm us in a second. This is the alpha male out of a pack of 22 wolves who come down and just look us over, roll around, yelp. He wanted me to yelp back, but I didn't really know how to talk to him. The other thing I noticed going out the arc is the volcanoes weren't all over. They were actually not only these lines, but they were only spaced every so often, active ones. You'd be in a ship or an airplane, every about 50 kilometers, they were spaced. It's a little bit messier when you have an old arc like this that has had repeated volcanism. But if you look at down the South Sandwich Islands, for example, which is another island arc down off between South America and, <coughs> and Antarctica, you see these, it's a young island arc just built up, but you can see these volcanoes. They're spaced. There's a spacing in them. They're just spaced apart in some sort of way. And then there's occasionally one behind. 
This guy is three million years old, this arc. This is only in the last one million years or so. And so if you look at what causes that, well, you can see a lot of things like this. And I'll tell you the truth of it. The idea came to me for what was causing this after a night of prolonged drinking for New Year's Eve with a bunch of other scientists. And I got up in the morning with an excruciating hangover, laying on this couch, just thinking about, I've been worried about this and thinking about this. And it suddenly came into my head, you know, instantaneous illumination. And what, what happens in this kind of circumstance is a fluid mechanical instability called a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, where one low-density fluid is pushed into another. This is when you throw something into a fluid, for example. Here's a crater on Mars, for example, the same kind of thing. And so I started doing experiments over here in Ames Hall in a tube of fluid. And what happens is here you start it out, and you open up the fluid, and these guys are coming up. And this is all open trough. And you can actually predict the spacing of these. And not only that, but you can actually predict the size of the, 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 the diaper, they call these, the, the body of magma that's coming up off these. Fantastic. And so we start applying this to the Earth because then you can find out something about the source characteristics. So what happens is the plate goes down, it starts melting, you get a ribbon of fluid, the fluid goes unstable, produces these volcanoes, and it starts migrating down as, the, as it more and more melting takes place. And suddenly then, it's thinner down here. You get occasionally, you get a small volcano growing up behind it. There are two in the Aleutians. And now these are spaced at a little different amount. So when you do the experiment dipping down, you get this strong, it's called the volcanic front, the Japanese call it. And then you get these other guys down here, and it's modified by the cosine. So you get 70 kilometers along the arc and only 50 kilometers down the arc. Now, once you have all these equations, you can actually invert it for finding what the source is. It turns out the source is only about 100 meters thick. And it's long, and it's very viscous, and I won't, it won't bore you with all the details, but you can actually find out what the source is. You're talking with it at a distance, and you can find out what it's doing. Down. It's a ribbon of magma, a very, very viscous, high, vo high viscosity material that goes up like thunderheads. And it's all organized, and it's organized in this kind of pattern. Now, on top of this, we also have the fact is, is that uh, we get to go throughout the world and spend time looking at areas that you would never, ever get into. So I tell my students, and I've told Rika and other people, you want to fashion a, 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 an occupation for yourself where you can have your thrills of life, exploring, investigating things, mix it in with an occupation that you can also get paid to do. So and that's what, when you do work on volcanoes, you get to go all over the world. There are volcanoes everywhere. So if you put you know, $20,000 in your NSF budget for travel, no one, no one worries about that. But if a mathematician puts in $20,000 for travel, they say, well, what, what's that all about? You know? <laughs> Can't you? And, and, and uh, so and this takes us to places like this. So this is a little village, 1,000 kilometers out in the Aleutians Islands. And what do you do? You, you get to go out and stay in this little village. And these people in the Aleutian, Aleutians came across, course in, across the Bering Straits a long time ago. And they moved down through, and they invented boats and things, and they got out here, and they went all the way over by Kamchatka. And when we came, this village has no landing strip, nothing. You had to fly out to a, a place about 100 miles away, take a Navy tug over here, and we'd stay with us. And these people, of course, they'd been out here, you know, five and 6,000 years. And they're very different. They don't say that much and back and forth. I don't have any pictures of them because they didn't like pictures taken of themselves. And so, so I would live in here, and on the north end of this island is just spectacular volcanoes. And I would work on here, and I worked several, several summers here, and they only had, you know, here's the Russian Orthodox Church because the Russians came through, the Bering came through here in the, in the 1700s, and uh, they're, they're all mixed in, so they have a Russian religion, and the Russian Orthodox priests would come every, you know, 10 years or so. so the house was not used, so I'd stay in the house, and they, I'd run out of food and things like this, and I'd see a reindeer roast just would appear. They knew. They knew everything going on without a lot of talking, and they take me in their boat to various places, and we learn various things. And I'd look out, then here's the volcanoes up to the north. In the evenings, you'd sit around, walk out, an occasional slight clearing of the, of the atmosphere. Just, you'd see these magnificent volcanoes, and I knew they were up there, and I went up there and mapped, and I worked up here 15 or 18 years. And the best thing also is that you have a little, a little something in the evening. We didn't have glasses. It's nice, of course. And I realized that if you, these are called wine tears. If you swirl this around in nice candlelight projected, you see these guys coming down like this. And this is the other part of the lecture, is that these instabilities can be used to gauge the viscosity and the alcohol content 
of, of the wines. And people have been doing this for long periods of time. And it adds to it about this whole thing. It's just the same thing upside down. And uh, so here it is looking down from, abo from above, this same instability. So I'm going to leave you right here with homework. And it involves alcohol, which is really fun. <laughs> so you go home tonight, you take a glass like this, and you swirl it around or even slosh it just back and forth gently and just wait and look at it. You can take a light and project it from one side onto a, onto a piece of paper, and there you will see these things forming. What I want to leave you with is also something that you should think about, and that is the stuff that I'm telling you about here is stuff that's been laying out there in front of us for millions of years. Human beings were always worried about or thinking about what these things are. You know, the stuff that Charles Darwin did, the stuff that, uh, a lot of stuff that Newton did, the stuff that Einstein did, it's right in front of us all the time. The plate tectonics that you're looking at, the configuration of the continents, it's sitting right there in front of us all the time, waiting for us to understand it and discover it and appreciate what it is for what it is. Now, having grown up as a little boy in northern Michigan, I was a cabin boy in these old big Lake Superior fishing boats, commercial fishing tugs, with old guys. I'd spend my summers at 10 years old. <coughs> and I was in the middle of the lake. We'd be out 40 miles in Lake Superior. It'd be just, they'd close it all up at the end of the day, and they'd just yell up to me, take her home. I was 10 years old. You know, it was fog and rain and stuff. They trusted me because I watched these guys. I knew what to do. I knew how to understand a compass and things like this. And yeah, we we show up at home at night. So the key is, when you look out and look at stuff, there's all kinds of stuff out there that's laying there for us to discover. And you just have to pick it up and take it and, and understand it and ask yourself, what the hell is going on here? And it's a lot of fun on top of it. So thank you very much for your attention.